So I find the uh, I find the first four words of this chapter to be perhaps some of the most important that human beings are primates. So if anyone ever wants to know how human beings evolve from primates, you say, nah, we're, we are primates. Do not worry about that. And interestingly, human beings were placed in the primate order by none other than our old friend from the last chapter, Linnaeus, who, as we described, was previous, he was prior to Darwin. He was a creationist. He believed he was he was classifying God's creation as according to the great chain of being and as according to the, the best way that, that, that God had designed it. And so he put humans as part of the primate order, which is kind of interesting that even before uh, Darwin and the evolutionary ideas that we saw of Lamarck or other, uh, other people at the time, uh, the, the creationists saw the the relationship between uh, the uh, non-human primates and the human primate. So there are a few things that uh, would make Linnaeus and others classify humans together in the primate order with these other primates. And there's a number of what uh, Levin and Schultz call shared traits or evolutionary trends. I'd just like to highlight a few of them because uh, it can get kind of complicated. Uh, so all the large bodied primates also have uh, a large and complex brain in relation to body size, uh, as we just saw in the video with the orangutans and others. Um, humans have a larger brain than others, but uh, that's true also of our uh, close primate relatives. The other thing that is interesting as the primate evolution uh, progresses is is that there's a reduction of facial projections. So the face becomes, uh, the, the nose is, is less pronounced. And as a result, uh, most primates have better sight than they do smell. So evolution always involves trade-offs. Um, so there are many creatures that can smell better than humans uh, and other primates, uh, but we get a little more of the, the stereoscopic being able to see in, in 3D from having our eyes frontally oriented like this. And the vision of, of humans and, and the other great apes is fairly similar. Um, all the large primates have an opposable thumb, so we're able to grasp things. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we've lost our opposable toes, but uh, this is a particular uh, development uh, among humans, but it's shared by our primate relatives as well. And, uh, very importantly, and as we uh, saw in the film, there's a long period of time in which uh, primate offspring, the infants, are extremely dependent upon their parents. And that's especially extended in human beings, but it applies to uh, chimps, bonobos, uh, orangutans as well. Um, what this does is it increases the importance of what you need to learn from your peers and from your uh, from the, the previous generation because for so long you are dependent upon you aren't able to go out and do things on your own and so uh, among all these groups you learn different customs and different ways to survive and so when we look again at any group uh, they don't all do the same things and that's because all of them uh, are dependent upon learned behavior We've talked about this a little bit, so I'll just uh, briefly go over the reasons why we study the non-human primates and include that as part of uh, anthropology. So one of the things we can look for are clues about uh, what, what the most recent common ancestor was like six to eight million years ago. And when I say clues, it's very important to understand that all of these primates are evolving as well. Evolution doesn't just stop and they and, and certain creatures are frozen while others go on. Uh, the chimpanzees of today are not what would have been uh, the most recent common ancestor six million years ago. 
Uh, as we talked about, there was a speciation event a couple million years ago uh, between uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. They can also give us clues to what people might be like today, as we saw in the What Are Friends 4. Again, you have to be very careful with making those kinds of cross species or cross group observations, but they can be a place where we can test different hypotheses or different ideas about uh, what it means to be human. There are a couple of different dangers that we encounter when we look at non-human primates. So one of them is, as we've talked about this idea of projecting our own thoughts, feelings, ideas onto uh, other creatures. Uh, we often do this with our, with our dogs, but we can do this with other creatures as well. And this is called anthropomorphism, where we take traits and project them onto things that are not human. And we talked about this as a danger of thinking, well, you know, they're just like us, or we are simply naked apes, as has been thought. Uh, this is not, uh, this is, this is a, a danger of looking at other primates. Um, the other danger, of course, is assuming they have nothing to tell us, or they have nothing to do with what with with our own uh, our own thoughts and emotions. And so things like friendship, of course, we can't ever know what is going on inside of another creature's head. Perhaps we can't even know what's going on inside of, of our own friend's head, but we can make deductions and we, we have to think about, there's a lot of research still to be done on individual uh, non-human animal personalities. Uh, different uh, ranges of emotions and behaviors. And so this is something that, that we have often dismissed as not part of non-human primate life, but it's, uh, it's, a hu it's enormously important, uh, these kinds of enorm uh, friendships and social bonds, uh, just like among human beings. As I mentioned, I think this paragraph on page 75 in Levin and Schultz is hugely important that if we look out across, if we do, if we look at all the different groups, all the different species, they're flexible in different habitats, have adapted to different habitats, and even there, there aren't even necessarily gen, huge generalizations you can make about species because they are differently adapted in different places. So flexibility, creativity, resilience uh, is, is what we see when we look at how primates adapt. A couple of you wanted to look at the chimpanzees in a little more depth, and that's good because we're going to be talking in the next class about uh, some of the stuff that started to happen between the uh, most recent common ancestor of, of chimpanzees, humans, and bonobos. So there are two living species of uh, chimpanzee in Africa. There's what we know of as the common chimpanzee, and that's what we see the most of. Uh, uh, the pan troglodytes. In recent years, what was originally described as a pygmy chimpanzee, uh, because some of them were smaller, some of the first uh, specimens now more commonly known or more appropriately known, I should say, as the bonobo or pan paniscus, is actually turns out to be a different species of, uh, of a different species from the common chimpanzee. Um, as we see in the, in the film and in other places, and some of you noted, chimpanzees are noted for, uh, for making uh, termite fishing sticks and other kinds of uh, leaves and, and things into tools. This is something that Jane Goodall most famously discovered uh, in her work. And then the bonobos, I sometimes you can probably uh, perhaps better for you to Google a YouTube video on the bonobos. Uh, they're, they're kind of famous for having a, a wide range of, um, how to say, a wide sexual repertoire. Uh, so uh, they have a lot of different, uh, different ways that they have non-reproductive sex and, uh, and non-heterosexual uh, non, uh, sex as well. Uh, and they're also known for having a pretty prominent role for the females of the group. Um, so quite different uh, social interactions than the chimpanzees. Uh, unlike that chimpanzee group that we just saw, there are no known documented cases of murder among bonobo groups. Um, so a quite different uh, 
uh, social system. And I guess I would say that, again, whenever we're thinking about what our closest relative is as human beings, we are equally related to, uh, to chimpanzees and bonobos. And some of the things that bonobos do are quite different from chimpanzees, which are also quite different from group to group. Lynn and Schultz bring up uh, a somewhat sophisticated uh, idea that has emerged in recent years uh, as part of anthropology. So some of the first primatologists prized trying to go out into what we might consider wild scenarios. Uh, so the idea was that you would try to study the non-human primates uh, in their own habitat and try not to interfere or try, try not to have any kind of uh, places that, that had no interaction with human beings. In recent years, uh, another discipline or part of primatology has emerged called ethnoprimatology. And it's distinguished because ethnoprimatologists are not so much trying to find the wild, pure area of, of any primate. They actually are also interested in the interactions between humans and non-human primates. So some of the famous uh, primatological studies uh, in ethnoprimatology are on macaques, which are actually a, an urban monkey, which, which live together with humans in different parts of Asia and actually live in, in cities and temples. And so it's a different form of studying the interaction between human and non-human primates. And so we talked about in the last class, this idea of the Anthropocene or this, if, if human beings are, could be considered to be great niche construction, people, how we have been remaking the world and remaking different habitats and changing uh, the entire planet. Uh, and, and this especially applies to uh, the habitat of the, of the primate, of our non-human primate uh, relatives. And so uh, at, whenever we look at, say, a video of um, apes, of the video that we just looked at, we have to consider how has this group or this, these, these creatures been influenced by human presence? And some of you had this as a question as, would that mean that the, if, if it weren't for human uh, niche construction and human influence, would the primates we see be different than they are now? And the answer is, I, I think, kind of. They would certainly not have suffered this, the amount of habitat loss that they have, so they might be uh, spread out more. In that group that we were just watching of chimpanzees, they probably were very concentrated, the number of males in that group, if, if they weren't uh, constrained by uh, the farming and other ways in which humans have encroached upon their habitat, they would have more room to, uh, to, to roam around. And probably their social behaviors would be different as well. I'm not going to speculate on if they would be sort of biologically uh, different evolutionarily speaking, but certainly a, whenever we think about the social behaviors or the ways, that, the findings of primatologists, we also have to think about how has this group uh, lived in interconnection with human beings? Because there's really no group of primates or other creatures outside of uh, this ongoing human influence. So in some ways, the, the ethno-primatologists have, have, I believe, successfully argued that, that in fact, every time we do primatology, we're doing ethno-primatology because we are always influencing, we are always part of the of the landscape there. So uh, every time we bring a, a camera in or, or bring some, to, some food to share or something like that, it's changing the social relationships. It's changing the aspects of, of what's going on. So this is uh, a few things, a few extra points from, the, from chapter three. Uh, hopefully we get a sense of primate diversity and flexibility. So as I mentioned in uh, the, next, uh, the next class, um, 